Um, good afternoon, folks. Thanks for joining today. Um, today, my colleagues and I, um, we're excited to walk you through the um, website redesign and Drupal development work we did for the Commonwealth of Virginia's DMV website, which if you live in the state of Virginia, you've probably been to before. If you haven't seen the new one yet, please go check it out. Um, putting customer experience, citizen experience at the forefront of our work was super important from the outset. Um, and ultimately, the teamwork that both of our companies worked on together led to a super successful project on time, on budget, and a happy client, which, as you all know, is really hard to do. So uh, we also have a couple client representatives in the room, so if you have questions for them after, um, they're here. Um, before we dive into the presentation pieces, we want to talk about who we are, who our companies are. Um, today I'm joined by Peyton Green. Peyton Green is a creative director at CapTech. Um, Peyton has about 18 years of experience um, with design agencies before consulting and primarily he was focused on designing and leading brand experiences when it came to the areas of manufactured products, re retail packaging, digital experience, and videos. So he has a lot of experience um, and he was the creative lead for the VMV, VA DMV um, redesign project. Um, I'm also joined by Bridget Bierhoff. She is a practice director at Form 1. Um, she has a master's in human computer interactions and almost 15 years of experience managing projects, web projects, including a lot of Form 1's most complex engagements. Um, she's also our launch planning expert. So she hops on various calls, projects, helps us with like kind of launch pieces and launch complications with launching a website. Um, and my name is Carrie Greer. Um, I'm a senior solutions architect at Forum One, and I focus, I'm one of our product managers and senior strategists, so I led a lot of our team, helping the client make complex, difficult decisions. Um, I've been in the Drupal community and in the Drupal world for over 15 years, built my first website on Drupal 4, have been around Drupal GovCons for a really long time, so I'm excited to share the amazing work that we've done for them. Um, a little bit about our companies, just to be clear, CapTech did the UX and design, Form 1, we did the Drupal implementation, so Peyton's going to talk about the UX part, and then Bridget's going to talk about development. Um, CapTech is a technology consulting firm focused on defining and delivering what's next for organizations. Um, as a community of driven, collaborative, collaborative and curious people, they really thrive on lasting, the lasting partnerships they build with their clients. And Form 1 is a digital agency focused on cra crafting impactful solutions for our customers. Um, we primarily work through public sector, um, including nonprofit foundations and government agencies. Um, the company pretty much started in Drupal. When I started in Drupal, I was like on our first project. So since 2009, built our first websites in four and five, been around in the Drupal world for a long time. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Peyton, who is going to talk about how this all started. Thank you, Carrie. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Carrie mentioned, um, I want to talk through just the UX and design portion of what we did for the Virginia DMV website. I want to highlight some of the process that we went through to create more modern and accessible experience. Um, but before I do that, I want to kind of step back to the beginning of all of this. So I think all of you remember when COVID hit. I think everyone can <laughs> relate to that. Uh, it changed a lot of things. Um, it changed the way we work, changed our relationships, changed the way we shopped, even changed the way we shook hands. Uh, but for the Commonwealth of Virginia's Department of Motor Vehicles, it changed the way its citizens were using its services and its website. So they were seeing an uptick in people coming to the site to try to get tasks done, but they were having trouble doing it. So what does this mean? Um, so a change was needed. So we needed to modernize the site for citizens to um, have easier access to those tasks that they couldn't, or maybe because of COVID at the time, preferred not to do in person. So part, part of this modernization effort also included uh, bringing the site up to be conformant with WCAG 2.1 standards. I think today it's now 2.2 has been released. Um, but it was a requirement for a govern, government agency, obviously, to be accessible for all citizens, regardless of uh, mental, physical, or behavioral impairments. So what we heard from the DMV, um, they wanted an exceptional customer, in this case, citizen experience. Um, at CapTech, we would actually begin to call this a front, a, our digital front door experience of the Virginia DMV. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, how do we solve for this? Uh, basically, we partnered with the DMV on a three-phased approach. So we started with an original site assessment. 
So looking at how we um, perform the research, we did a heuristics analysis, we performed usability testing. We needed to understand what were the pain points um, and establish the benchmarks that we can measure against so we knew we were moving forward. Um, the second piece of this was information architecture analysis. So understanding our audience and their intentions. Um, we had a pretty complex navigation. We had a lot of content on the site. We just needed to be able to figure out how to organize and deliver that in a meaningful way. And our third phase was a component-based design strategy. So setting those core building blocks across a primary number of pages um, and some supporting documentation to drive development. So we were actually not under scope for development at the time, so we had to build something that would be adopted to kind of any kind of de development strategy at the time. So let's talk about the assessment. Um, we proposed this assessment basically to understand the current state of their site. Um, we heard a few things from them. We understood that they were having issues, their users were having issues, but we needed to understand where exactly they were before we could envision where they could be. Um, so to do this, we actually went through four main activities. So we started with a heuristics analysis. This is something that um, pairs really well with our research. Um, for those that don't know, it's easy to spin up. We had a couple UX researchers that can do this pretty quickly. Um, it uncovers a lot of issues um, with the user experience, and we focus the tasks on Jacob Nielsen's 10 uh, general principles for interaction design, um, plus one additional for information architecture. So we had, like, like I said, the, the, the IA was very complex, so we wanted to make sure that we were testing against that as well. So you can see there's a lot of red in here, so a lot of room for improvement. Um, we then had an inclusive design team come in and do a full accessibility review. Um, we did this on, I think, about nine pages of the original site. So those nine pages were selected based on how they represented all the interactions on the rest of the site. Clearly, we can't scan hundreds and hundreds of pages, so this gave us our best kind of baseline. Um, you can see we had a number. We had 54 global issues, 69 unique issues. I want to point out a site that's been around for a long time, that's been out there, it's been managed, you know, it's been edited for a while, you have a lot of content and technical debt. This is not uncommon. Uh, we still need to document this to make sure that we were proceeding in the design phase in the correct manner. And then stakeholder workshops. I've heard this several times throughout the day, but uh, stakeholder workshops are really important for alignment. Um, so we held these to make sure that we could understand um, not only the website goals, but business goals that the DMV had and any kind of uh, future expectations that they had. We also um, talked with them about the experience goals that their citizens might um, expect or desire. So the one thing about that is if anyone's been to a DMV, your expectations and your desires can vary greatly, <laughs> right? I'm just gonna say that nicely. So it was our job to uh, narrow the gap on those two things. Um, but their DMV product team was amazing at giving us a lot of like detailed information about how their citizens interacted with them um, in person, online, or even calling into the call centers with questions. We got a lot of great information by working with them. And then the fourth one was usability testing. So creating those benchmarks um, that we can measure against in the future. So we ended up doing usability testing um, with small groups through Optimal Workshop. Um, we spun these up, we did it on the original site. We did it again during the wireframing process, and then we did it uh, after site launch, I believe. And I think we're going to continue to do those. And speaking of which, um, I wanted to share this quote, honestly, because it came out of our initial testing. Um, I think they delivered the feedback very nicely and very well, uh, but it just it basically framed up exactly what we were trying to solve for. Right, so the site is presented really academically, but a lot of people are not going to take the time to read this and call someone. So that's exactly what we're trying to solve for, not calling as much. Um, so the assessment taught us a lot. There was a lot of content, um, a lot of really rich and good content, but it was oftentimes um, miscategorized, slightly unorganized. Again, from a site that's been around for a number of years, this happens. It's the content that we all experience. So some key themes started to emerge. These might seem obvious, but um, the more we learn, the more we realize that we need to solve for findability, obviously finding content, finding what you need, the tasks that you need to perform, usability, being able to use the site, and accessibility, having everyone, all citizens of the Commonwealth of Virginia be able to use the site. 
So information architecture, let's dive into phase two. So um, thinking about this, we want to prioritize those tasks that are most relevant um, while still making secondary and tertiary content um, easily accessible. And it's good to point out here that the Commonwealth of Virginia is kind of unique in their situation in the sense that their DMV offers far more services online than most state agencies do. Um, so we had actually a ton of stuff to work with. <laughs> Um, we started with design targets. So these fall in the realm of personas. They are not personas in the sense because personas kind of go more in detail, more in depth. Um, we did these as a way to quickly understand and map out some of the tasks, tasks that people were coming to the site to, um, to accomplish. So if you think about the average driver renewing registration for a mobile device, or at the bottom, you've had someone that's looking for information about restricted driving privileges because of a recent traffic altercation. So this gave our design team the ability to put themselves in the minds of the user. Um, while this was happening, we had uh, part of our team scan the entire site. Um, this isn't the sexiest of documents in this presentation, but it's very critical um, to getting us to the end stage. Uh, we ma mapped out all the different levels of the site. Um, it enabled us to see exactly how everything was grouped, everything was, existed in the current state. Um, it gave us the ability to then use this to create the future state navigation. Um, Bridget's actually going to reference this in a little bit to how it was used for content migration too. Um, so with all that in mind, we performed two tasks. We want to do this with the users. So we did a tree jack study and a card sort. So for those that don't know, a tree jack study is basically asking a group of individuals to complete a task on the site. It's our way of seeing how they find content. So it's how they mind map and move through the navigation and figure out what getting what they need to get out of the site. Um, that can be successful or it could not be successful. That tells us kind of how easy things are, are, done, are working on the site. A card sort goes really well with that because it enables us to um, see how people group and organize content topics. So you have, um, I should probably make this clear that like there's a lot of uh, organizations and agencies, they know their product better than anyone. They understand their services. They group those services sometimes one way internally and they sometimes think that external users group them in the exact same way and that's often not the case. So a card sort can kind of help identify where people expect to see information. So we don't want to be on one end of it or the other. We kind of find, want to find that kind of happy medium in the middle. Um, so moving into the wires, we were able to kind of move right into navigation and put this into play. So we started with a global navigation up top. Um, things like online services takes you to everything that you can accomplish on the site. Locations, if you need to go into a, a, a physical location. Um, you have a search field, log into your account, all those kind of quick and easy um, nav items. Then we had a main navigation that we put in place. So this was kind of a top drawer navigation. Um, this was something that you could actually click into too. It wasn't like a hover state type of thing. It was fully accessible, um, easy to use, using a keyboard like tab navigation or uh, voice assisted technology. And then um, once you got below deck, there was a sidebar navigation that we brought in for the deeper levels of content. Um, this thing, I will say, was not easy. <laughs> it looks easy. It was not easy. Uh, we went through several iterations um, to figure out how that would work through all the different levels of content. We had, if you get down in level four or five, whatever, there's can be one child, there can be 30 children underneath the site. So we had to make sure that that was all um, taken care of, it was scalable, and also it had the right interaction states to be accessible. So that was fun stuff. So now we'll get into a little bit of the design. Um, so we needed to figure out a way to design for a large site and stay, well, in a manageable fashion while staying in budget. Um, so like I mentioned before, we were not under scope for development at this time, so there's still outliers on what platform um, or CMS the DMV was gonna use. So we had to ensure that whatever team came in, like these guys, um, had what they needed, had plenty of documentation um, to adopt it to their development strategy. Um, so to kick off design, we reviewed DMV's communication materials and brand assets. Um, we wanted to establish kind of a fresh visual system that would support the website design. 
I'm not going to say this was a brand refresh because it was not that, but it was simply just kind of a visual refresh um, of their exterior visuals. So we modernized the look and feel um, with a web safe type system, accessible color palette. Uh, we had new photography that we spec'd for this. Um, we wanted to span the landscape of Virginia, obviously from Blue Ridge to Chesapeake, give them something that they were really proud of. Um, wanted to give them the look and feel that they could kind of carry through other experiences from here on out. So almost like back out of the site into other communication materials if needed. Um, and actually this system was uh, a pretty big hit. This is the bare minimum of the system. You'll see more. But it was a pretty big hit that influenced uh, the Vita design system that was just released this year. So um, focusing heavily on design components, um, it made for a really great foundation for other state agencies to use. Vita is more for the broader Commonwealth of Virginia. Yes, exactly. Um, so this gave us the baseline for applying visual designs to the various page components that we set up during the wireframing stage. Um, so we created these core set of building blocks um, that were for that we started with on a, on a some uh, baseline marquee pages. I think we had 25 pages that we started with. Um, we wanted to build it so you could expand beyond that, obviously, because you've got hundreds of pages on the site. Um, so we accounted for lots of things. We had page headers, navigation elements, CTAs, video players, um, just copy blocks, everything across desktop and mobile. Um, as we accounted for these things, we uh, would design them, sign off on them, and bring them into a component library. That component library became great, part of a greater system that you're going to see. Um, and that was a final deliverable for this as well. So what that does is it creates familiar patterns across a site. So and that always helps to improve the overall user experience. So with that approved, we had a style guide that we pulled together. Um, we included details like um, type and header styles, uh, iconography, color, photography, everything you see. Um, the icons, I thought, turned out great. Our design team did a fantastic job on all this, but the icons were really cool. They gave it a little bit of depth to kind of a modern, flat design. Um, we documented everything within the style guide. Um, we're showcasing the grid, like the 12 column grid. Uh, we're showcased padding, margin settings, um, a lot of different elements and documentation in here. Just for us, the more the better. It helps with implementation, so there's no guesswork. And then finally, our team created um, just a full set of accessibility annotations. Um, these were highlighted necessary elements like um, uh, link details, table and data formatting, um, header styles, um, decorative elements, whatever that may be. So we did this for all 25 pages that we designed for. Um, it's pretty ex extensive detail because we knew that we would have to hand this off uh, possibly blindly and we had to make sure that we had all that documentation there. So all this, these guidelines and documentation really help our team to that point communicate intent and in functionality in what we do. Um, it creates efficiencies in development and it minimizes risk during development handoff. Um, so the output of these three phases gave the Virginia DMV team the supporting assets and confidence that they needed uh, to move into development even with unknowns still on the table. Which brings me to the question, how do we build it? So I'm gonna hand it over to Bridget, talk to her. Thanks. Um, so unfortunately, what he mentioned handing off blindly did end up actually happening. For project context outside of everyone's control, um, our team and Peyton's team didn't get to have any contact with each other. So despite that, though, we were still able to center that citizen experience. Um, and a few key ways that we were able to do that is as Peyton just said, really well documented designs. I've never gotten better annotated designs ever, and it was phenomenal. Um, the, but they also handed off their user research, the research materials, the results, the insights, which was really helpful. Um, we on our side made sure that we had a user experience expert in-house on central to the project throughout. Um, to keep that through line. And the Virginia DMV team was a through line throughout, po partly through who they chose to work with, teams that really are passionate about the citizen experience and have that expertise, as well as um, just bringing their own 
context, their own awareness, their own uh, subject matter expertise, their own passion for the citizen experience into all the conversations. Um, as Peyton mentioned, it was a, a um, platform agnostic design, which really let them center the user experience without being constrained by the uh, whatever the uh, content management system was going to be. Um, but that also introduced a step where, at the very beginning, we had to adapt the designs and the selected CMS Drupal to each other um, as we began the development phase. Um, it, also would have been needed because Peyton touched on how many pages they were. Um, the previous site was all flat HTML and ASP and it was thousands of pages of it. It's a lot. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about one of the key activities we did with this, putting together a content model. Um, but one of the first things we had to do was really prioritize the work um, because of the designs that um, Peyton's team put together were thorough, detailed, overall excellent they were also intentionally more extensive that was, than was necessary for the initial build and delivery. Um, so in order for us to be successful, we at Forum One worked closely with the Virginia DMV team to really collaboratively focus carefully on the work that was really needed for the initial build for, in order to launch with a site that was robust, reliable, usable, accessible, maintainable, and also delightful that they could then build and expand from over time in an iterative learning way. Um, so this took the form of a big push at the beginning when then incremental decisions along the way as, as we ran into tweaks or adjustments that might be needed as we built, tested, populated content, prepared for post-launch, that kind of stuff. We made sure at every step along the way that we had the right voices in the room for making these sort of prioritization decisions. That meant the DMV's expertise. It also meant having our user experience lead in-house there, as well as you know, QA development of various <coughs> different stripes, content management, etc. It's not so helpful to have the voices in the room, though, if they can't speak up or can't be heard. So it was really important that we set up and curated a team culture um, uh, that was really collaborative um, and really, the way we set it up and curated it throughout, that was really collaborative across the Form 1 and DMV core team together. Um, one that really emphasized op openness, realism, that shared passion for the, the citizen experience and for delivering the best experience we could within the project constraints. So we very intentionally made sure that everybody on the project really understood the, the goals, the project context, the audiences, all of that. So that, for example, I remember, I think you, Carrie, at one point, um, were just saying, I'm trying to think of like a single mother with her three kids screaming in the back of her car trying to find a DMV so she can get something renewed. Like it's, it's really helpful to have that context. Um, it also helped that all of us have had some sort of experience with the DMV before, so we have a little bit of that already that we bring to bear. Um, so, but this was really critical because it meant when we did run into any miscommunications or challenges or anything like that, we could, we would call those out directly, openly, honest, honestly, and can together figure out what the best solution was across, consider, taking into consideration all those constraints. Um, we also were very intentionally non-hierarchical in how we set up our team and the team communications. Um, while maintaining very clear uh, individuals who are responsible and accountable for the key types of decisions. So we would regularly have like a developer who is working on something saying, hey, I have some accessibility concerns about what I'm about to build. Um, have we thought about this trade-off here? Or a QA lead would call out, oh, um, I could see a user experience issue with this thing that we're about to build all along the way. It helped that the product owner at the DMV site is one of the, was one of the most like empowered, effective, and um, realistic product owners have had the joy to work with. Um, that definitely helped set this up. And just a quick example, we had a shared JIRA instance throughout the project that both Form 1 and DMV were in, so we could talk through some of the nitty gritty there on the actual tickets themselves. So jumping back, I mentioned a content model. So when we're starting with this um, CMS agnostic design, and we know we're building it in Drupal, one of the first things we need to do is figure out how does the content 
the code, the design, how do they all fit together? How do they all work together? What is the structure of that? And the content model is the key to that. It's really what lets us pin down, um, yeah, how these all, the structure of how these all play together. Um, and we did this in a big push at the beginning as part of that prioritization, and then iteratively adjusted along the way and kept it all updated to one central place. Um, so just real quick here, um, if anyone's not seen the content model or something like this before, um, for each, we had a different tab for the content types and the paragraphs, and for each content type, so each row, like this is basic page, further down there's like DMV location, getting right in the eye, sorry. Um, for each of them we say what the different field types there are, like the na page name, title, hero, sidebar content, what type of content that is, if it's a paragraph reference, if it's short text, if it's WYSIWYG content, um, machine name for making sure we're clear internally if we're building it, is it required or not? Um, cardinality, uh, we also would have on here like, is it indexed by search? Other things like that. It's the real structure of how the content and the code play together. We also would have another tab here for view modes. So you have a DMV location. You have all the fields and how they're gonna be displayed on the detail page, but there's also a view mode for that page on like the listing page of what shows there from for that particular type of content. So we did this before development, documented changes here as we went if we ran into quirks of the particular content we're entering into the site that required changes, things like that. Um, and yeah, this was really critical to making sure the site wasn't just built in a way that centered the citizen experience but could be maintained in that way because citizen experience doesn't just come down to the design and the development, it also comes down to having the marriage of those with really good, well-structured content. So we've mentioned the old site was flat HTML and ASP and thousands of pages of it. That meant mostly manual content migration um, was necessary. There was some more structured content that we could um, programmatically upload to the site and then refine there. And there is some content that is pulled in through a custom API-like interfaces, a few of them. But the vast majority of it had to be manually migrated. And that, when you're manually migrating thousands of pages, that takes some planning. Um, so it, it, CapTech set us up really well for that. That spreadsheet that he was showing you before, he was like, it's not the sexiest thing. This is the even less sexy version that we turned it into, where we expanded that and um, used that to, like having the indi each individual page, what level it is in the navigation, what content type is it gonna be built as, referring back to that content model. And then there's more tabs over here for the old URL, the new URL, so we could have that for redirects. Um, the status it is in the migration, has it even started yet, has it been reviewed? Um, any issues or questions that have been run into, maybe linking to a JIRA ticket or two, if there are any um, that were identified that were related to that particular piece of content. Um, all sorts of other things like that as we were going through the work and that let our content management, our content specialists and the DMV content specialists collaborate together to bash out that migration and to identify any blockers or concerns and co collaborate on those as we got through it. Um, it I mentioned it that client, customer experience, citizen experience, um, depends on really good structured content. Thousands of pages of content can't get reworked and updated it, without significantly delaying the launch of this great new site. So, and the DMV was aware of that from the get-go, so at least by the time we started working with them, um, and had prioritized um, some what they called marquee pages that they really focused on reworking the content of, knowing that they could iterate on the rest of them later once the site had been launched. Again, the setting it up once, great. How does it live that way long term? How do you maintain that? Um, just given the editorial ongoing maintenance context that the site was living in, we intentionally chose dr a Drupal site, a very simple Drupal site um, with paragraphs and uh, gesso for one standard Drupal theme um, that, uh, to build the site. We did use paragraphs so that we could build out those robust uh, you know, components for the DMV to use. But overall, it is 
technologically, other than the API, the custom APIs and a couple of other things, it's a relatively simple technological site. The one area, the other area that needed a bit more, um, more complicated technical implementation and where we needed to do more reworking from the designs that were handed to us was the maps and location listing. Um, and that's simply because of the, somewhat the timeline, but mostly the technical constraints of the actual underlying technology. Um, so it, it depended a lot more on that. So we had to go through a few different, um, played around with a few different options for how we could build these. We had to change things a bit more for the, the mock-ups that we were delivered. And that's where getting the user experience, the, sorry, the, the user research results, as well as the designs really helped because we could better understand the why behind the designs as we navigated through some of the options, possibilities, trade-offs as we dug into um, both the technical options as well as the nuances <coughs> of the underlying data that it had to pull. Enough about how we built it. I'm going to hand it off to Carrie to talk about what we built. Yeah, so I always feel like in these presentations people just talk at you <laughs> and then you never like see the live site. So let's go look at the live site um, while we have a few minutes. We can figure out how to do that. Um, one of the things, for, just from an architectural standpoint, to, to give you some more details is Form 1 is not a layout builder shop. I'm just going to put it out there. We are paragraphs people. That is what we do. So um, their team didn't have any CMS experience. One guy had worked with Craft and WordPress a little bit. So they were coming from, hi, I have some JavaScript in Dreamweaver land. So if we try to do headless and fancy moving things around, it wasn't going to work for them. Like they were just like, this is going to be the first CMS they've ever had and inter interacted with. So we needed to make intentional choices so that their development team could, you know, work on the site in the long term and commit code themselves. So that's the other thing we did during development is we trained them on Drupal. They'd never used Drupal before. They're new to the community. They've never built a module. They've never configured and installed a module. They don't. They didn't know what a module was. So we had to teach them from the ground up. As you know, you've seen that curve where like the Drupal guy is like falling off a cliff backwards, and then he like gets back up and like that. So it can be difficult for people in the Drupal community. That's why we intentionally chose a very standard Drupal approach. We used Forum One's Drupal theme that we built called Gesso. And that's why it's not complicated. Um, so let's go ahead and look at some of the micro interactions. One of the things we always like to do, um, especially if we're ha getting handoff designs, is how can we add like flourishes too to the design that aren't necessarily, you know, you can't do that on a piece of paper. You can't do that in a Figma document, right? But this is like some of the things like the arrows like to pop out and they hover. Um, again, the boxes, they highlight. These change color. Again, none of that stuff was in the design components, right? So the components that they gave us, we kind of had to make our own decisions along the way, especially like this one. That, that one's fun. Um, Tommy, who was our front end developer, really had fun kind of going to town with adding those little flourishes that make the site really feel complete. Um, let's talk a little bit about the technology on the locations page as well. So this is the um, locations page on the site. Um, one of the things that automatically happens is we have a cron running every five minutes. This was very contentious, so I can go into details if you want. And that shows, yeah, the, you, you know what that means. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, this shows if the location is open or closed. So they have a system internally that's in an Oracle database. Um, we pull and crawl their APIs every five minutes and it will show us if the location is open or closed. This is on this page as well as the detail page. Um, the other thing about maps, which was fun, is we had to go through, I would say, two, three, four iterations of different contributed modules to accomplish what um, Peyton's team had designed. Um, I would say that had we done it again, we know what we're doing now, but, you know, it'd been a while since our team had honestly used Google Maps API. We kind of like shied away from it so we found something it worked was it ideal no but you know something that our team's thinking about using improving on it in the future so this is the google maps api series of contrib modules that makes this work the pins are nice you click on a pin 
the list automatically updates, which I think is nice. Go to a detail page. Again, the one automatic thing on this page is the open now feature, which shows you if something's opened or closed, and that's basically populated by this. But we also took take into account um, state of Virginia's state holidays, so it'll automatically show closed if it is a state of Virginia state holiday, and that's all programmed in as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about lists and views. Again, we're using views, standard Drupal stuff. Um, the one thing that, um, you know, what happens when you get a design and you're trying to implement is that design only goes so far. So again, you need to make intentional choices about what you're going to do from a citizen experience to make it consistent. So all of the lists across the site, some of the things that Peyton's team didn't get to, we made an intentional choice to make the lists all look the same. So if you're on whatever listing page you're on, they all look the same, they all look, have the same design. That also makes it easy from a content development standpoint um, because you can add stuff to pages. So we made, we created a listing page content type. So each listing page is a page and you can add paragraphs to it. So if you wanna add content above or below and some of those components to your heart's desire, good for you, do that. Um, so let's go back to locations and talk a little bit more about a couple more Oracle APIs we have running. So DMV has a contact of connects and selects, which basically is additional DMV services that are offered at different locations and not a DMV service center. So understanding all of that and us figuring out how all that fit together, again, wasn't something that paid, like we hadn't, that wasn't quite all the way figured out. We kind of had to like be like, okay, like there was no design for this page. Like we had to figure out, okay, what is this gonna look like? How is this gonna work? How is this gonna work with the Google Maps API? So we had to take their designs, iterate on them a little bit to make this work. Again, this is an Oracle API. So they have an Oracle database in house that they update. Um, this runs daily to pull them in every morning around 6 a.m. So every morning um, this pulls from the Oracle API. Earlier than that, but yeah. Earlier than that, okay. Um, and this is updated, and again, this is like location information for um, that. And then there's also clinics. Oh, I did. I spelled this wrong, didn't I? Cool. Again, another Oracle database API call that runs out and grabs this content. So if you want to take driver training, again, you can see from the list styles intentionally the same. Um, so I know you all probably have some questions. So questions, those questions, thoughts. Yeah, go ahead. Olivia? Yeah. Um, could you explain a little more about the listing page content type? Yeah. Do your content managers actually use that and edit those listing pages? Or? They can, yeah. Because we're using views and we're like, don't touch it. <laughs> yeah, so basically, well, let's put it in the header. I'm like, well, yeah, I can show you in the back end later, but basically there's a listing page content type. You can select the view that you want to appear on that particular page, but then, and we can lock that part down. Okay. And then the part that they can edit is I need to add a box to the top of the page that says whatever they want it to say. And this is something we've done on a lot of our Client projects, this one and two, because it helps with, A, the view part is separate. No one has to touch the view part. Right. But if I need stuff, boxes, alerts, highlight boxes, above or below, that's the solution that we've come up with. It really works. It only works, though, if your listing pages are like designed relatively the same, which all work. So that really, really worked. It was super simple. And then they can go in, you know, they want to add up, you know, news box to the news page. They can do that. I think I saw another question. Are there more questions? I was, um, I was wondering about Matt. You said it was a Google Maps API. Correct, yeah. Which is pulling just the data, or is it uh, a whole thing using Google Maps together? Because it sort of kind of reminded me a little bit of an S rate, so I was just it's yeah, so the kind of yes, kind of no, but yeah, yeah, the question in the back of the room was asking about the map. So no, this is a Google map. It is not Esri. This is a Google map. Um, they have a license for Google Maps that they use. 
Um, and we used a series of contrib modules. Um, so this part that you see is it's why it looks familiar. It's because it's a Google map. The part on the left and above is not, uh, yeah. but connects in with it. Yeah. Uh, that's why we said yeah, kind of yes, kind of no. And there were some quirks to it that we had to do, like, I think we had to append Virginia to the back of search terms, for example, because at some points it was, you'd search for a name and it would find that city in a completely different part of the world or things like that. Yeah, so there's some quirks, but we made it, got it to work. Yeah, do you, you have a question? You were you used you tried some other mapping solutions, but they didn't pan out. What did you try, and what were the pitfalls? We we tried different um, contribute contribute. Yeah, modules. different contributors. We, knew we were going to use Google Maps. Oh, yeah. If that, I don't know. If that we knew from the get go we were going to use Google Maps because that was ultimately in the design and what they had access to, and was the map they already had. So they already kind of had an iteration of Google Maps. The the pitfall, and I think this is a pitfall in the community is. There's maybe one, two, or three different Google Maps contributed modules that are out there. We got one of them to work for our particular use case for what Peyton's team designed, but there were a couple things we made them leave off the table because we were like, that's not going to work. Like, that micro interaction that was discussed is just not something that. So, I guess that, that's going back to the client experience, right? Which is the whole. We would talk to the customer and say, is this really enhancing what a client needs to do on the website? If the answer was no, then it was easily ditched. Um, but yeah, it's Google Maps. And I can I can pull the list of contrib modules if you guys want to stay after and, and we can talk about those. Yeah. Did you have to upload your own geospatial data or did it automatically recognize it when you try to? So the question in the back was, did we have to upload our own geospatial data, or did they automatically recognize it? Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure we uploaded our own geospatial data. I don't remember. I, I don't remember. Like... I don't know. Um, no, because we had lat longs. That's right. For the did. points. Okay, we did. Yeah, so yeah. we had our uh, DMV also had a set of like lat long okay. identification points okay. for both these, which is their customer service centers, as well as the other ones. Yeah. Um, the selects, so this is a map page as well, yeah. um, and we were able to to use that. Oh. Okay. Question? Question? So, how did, so you guys did an iterative rollout, right? You did your major key pages for the new design, and you left the others the we more interior did. pages. We, we actually so rolled everything out. Oh, did you? Yeah, okay. we were iterative. Um, the DMV was iterative in which pages they reworked. How, more yeah. heavily to make use okay. of the new design system, the components that okay. were available, versus just copy paste to make sure it's not yeah. terrible. And do it. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't. We, we had yeah. like 25 marquee pages mm -hmm. that yeah. basically covered the majority of the visitors and traffic that was coming yeah. to the sites. We started yeah. there, built there. And what we mean, we phase it, meaning we didn't build all the design components. There's like probably 10 or 20 of them that we didn't build. Yeah. They're just not even there yet. We'll build them when. They, we need them as content gets updated, but there's a lot that we didn't build. It's less critical. Yeah. Yeah, in the back. The site looks so good. I'm cruising yeah. online right now. You guys did a great job. Thanks. Thank you. Like, even the really, really deep down pages look like yeah. they were really well designed keyway. So I'm wondering, like, did you have, like, what was your process getting a client to upload content, right, and then check that, and then make sure, like, every single page looked so good? Well, yeah, I will tell you, they had a full-time content migration strategy person okay. that they hired. Yeah. She was full-time. Yeah. That was her job. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, that's the magic bullet. The planning spreadsheets, all that stuff helps, yeah. But Lindsay, um, she works for DMV. She wrote the content, uploaded it. There's still pages they're iterating on. There's yeah. still pages where I'm like, why aren't there? Why aren't the icon style is there? Why are there lists? Mm -hmm. Like so, they're still you know they still have work to do, but they had a full time person, and then we also did a lot of the migration yeah. for them as well. So we had an hours cap of four hundred hours, something like that. Four hundred hours to help them with migration, which is yeah. a lot of time. Yeah. And we had a team of four people who weren't just migration experts. We had our content strategy team and wow. communications team at Four and One do a lot of that, and their eyeballs are different than a random intern, right? 
We also so, had yeah. somebody, a couple people from our quality assurance team do yeah. the migration and be part of all of those conversations as we were writing questions there, because and they acted as connected tissue with the dev team as well. Um, and back and forth of like, oh, you're running into this issue and you're entering content, there's a known issue, uh, and yet another level of connection. Or, oh, hey, dev team, like, we're trying to enter this content and we're running into this issue here. Um, Is that tracked in Jira? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the content migration was not, but any issues we ran into were. The content migration was in that spreadsheet, because um, that's yeah. what we, we started with. It worked great. That's yeah. where you have like, who's my, if somebody's in progress migrating it, it's been migrated, has it been reviewed by the DMV yet, yes, no. All of those different pieces were all tracked there so that they could work in parallel all along the line through these thousands of pages. Yeah. But we had regular, during, once content migration yeah. started, we very intentionally focused on building out the content types needed for migrating the bulk of the content first, even though they were the less technically uh, risky pieces because we knew the content migration was gonna be such a big lift. Yeah. And we got them started early on that. Um, and um, we, uh, there's a point I was going towards that I don't remember. I would say we finished early too. Yeah. Like, we weren't uploading content the day before. No one was yeah. freaking out. Like, none of that happened. Yeah. We were done with migration two to three weeks before launch. We launched. Launch day was fun. There was something we figured out at the last minute, but it was a technical issue we were able to overcome. But other than that, there was no, like, it's midnight the day before and the homepage, you know, they they had their team. Yeah. They had the letter from the commissioner written two weeks before. Like, yeah. it just worked somehow. That's why we well, wanted to well, share. Well, no, a lot of work. Yeah, a lot of prep. <laughs> but I, I think it goes back to their team and our team having a shared, A, towards the client, the citizen experience. Yeah. We're building this. Everybody knew that the old site needed to go away. And we have a shared goal to get this done, to do it right, and leave plenty of time. Mm -hmm. And it just, I'll, yeah, we're. I will 100% second that. That alignment from the very beginning, I think, is what yeah. helped us yeah. become such, such a successful site launch. Yeah. So. Sorry, there's another question? Yeah, I, I'm sorry if you already shared this, but how, what was the duration of this whole effort? <laughs> well, the whole thing, or just build? <laughs> like, start to finish? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll be frank. Three years, okay. um, but I will tell you the design phase. You probably was like a year. So we did. We started the assessment in June of 2020. That was my little COVID note going back there. Yeah. Um, that was a four to four to five week assessment, and then there was a six to seven month design phase. And then there was a gap of a period of time, and our from the kickoff to launch was about. Ten months? Eight months? Yeah. Ten months? Ten months. Like that? Yeah, there was a big contracting gap because they picked something that wasn't Drupal and that didn't work out, and then they picked another thing that wasn't Drupal and then that didn't work out, and then we were third time's a charm. So by the time it came to our team, I think they just had some procurement, like, heartache, um, and that's kind of why, again, it, when you have shared success like that, it, it really brings everybody together. I think if you compress it without the gaps, Year Probably a year and a half, yeah. yeah, without the gaps. More questions? One more thing I want to mention technologically. We didn't do the transactions. That is a separate yeah. whole other thing by other people. So if you go to like my account or whatever, um, at the same time while we were building the site, they also worked on my uh, the whole process internally of really improving all of these. It's still a long way to go, but internally, like originally, like if you remember two, three years ago, if you lived in Virginia, this did not look like this at all. So at the same time, where they were migrating their website, they were also like really modernizing their transactions as well. But again, that is all internal, and these are Oracle and custom pages. So no transactions are in Drupal. Um, any more questions? Can you guys do the Maryland website? Yeah. <laughs>